But I think there's uh, some advantages and some disadvantages uh, to when you think about the sustainability of electronic literature. There's a good way of looking at it, a bad way of looking at it. Of course, there's a big problem in that uh, electronic literature sort of moves at the pace of, of technological change. So when we author something, you know, there was a lot of work authored in BASIC or HyperCard or StorySpace, mm -hmm. these platforms that are essentially no longer uh, accessible, or Flash is a good example. There was a, a ton of digital poetry produced in the last decade that now, you know, they're, they're no longer supporting Flash. The, the good side of things is that the field has been very aware of this. So you have... Uh, you have writers and you have uh, literary scholars suddenly becoming archivists because like when we, for example, when we published the first electronic literature collection, um, which is a, a large collection of, of works that are sort of uh, preserved and, and disseminated by the electronic literature organization, that was in response to the fact that uh, I was teaching and, you know, a year after I had taught a course, I would go to the syllabus and, you know, a third or half the works would no longer be accessible. So that was a kind of solution to that problem. Or now we have the electronic literature repository uh, that Dini Grigar at Washington State University is putting together, where they're actually now recovering uh, literary magazines uh, online from the 1990s and 2000s that had gone offline uh, and had been gone for almost a decade. And now they're bringing back uh, all of those works and putting them in a repository and publishing them online. And people are exploring uh, strategies like uh, emulation um, or virtual machines where you can actually, you know, log into a machine that's running, uh, that's running Mac OS 9 uh, and, and run some of the programs that were accessible then. So, so the, the bad news is that the very nature of the form is sort of ephemeral. Mm -hmm. The good news is that people are figuring out strategies and it's, it's, it's much easier now to get access to some of the works from, you know, the, even from the 1950s, 1960s, some of the very earliest uh, poetry generators, because people have gone back and done the work and made them accessible in, in new formats. The collaboration with Clarin, I think, will be very useful. Uh, so by getting, by getting the documentation into the virtual language observatory, we're really exposing it to new audiences. I think, for example, there's a lot of connections that can be made between uh, linguists and literary scholars. Um, I think a lot of people would be interested in this work, people, for example, who are interested in uh, natural language processing or story generation or, or poetry generation. Uh, it has a lot of connections to, uh, to work that's being done in, in computational linguistics. So that's, that's one thing. But also the, the VLO, I think, is intended to be uh, a kind of engine to get to all of these different language resources in, in Europe. And of course, uh, literature is a language, is a, a language resource. It's, it, we, we sort of move beyond the idea of just, uh, of just a corpus of, of a given language to do linguistic work with it. So there's that. And then that also makes it searchable in the National Library of Norway and perhaps other national libraries. It also ties into some efforts that we're uh, conducting with something called the Consortium for Electronic Literature that is essentially a consortium of different databases and archives. There's 11 different partners internationally uh, now in that project, and we're doing federated search across all those databases as well. So it's really about making the archive and making the documentary archive uh, accessible to new audiences and to researchers who will think of different things to do with it. A computational linguist will, will look at this data in a much different way uh, than someone who's looking at it from the standpoint of, of literary history or of design or of uh, computational uh, history. For example, the electronic literature collections, the, the three large collections of 40 works to 100 works each that the electronic literature organization has published. In each case, we asked, the editors asked uh, the authors, 
if it was okay to publish it on their Creative Commons license. Um, which is great because that means that, uh, for example, the electronic literature collection, you could install it on a, a whole bunch of uh, computers in the school without having to ask uh, for permission. So I'd say that it's the, the culture of electronic literature is much more um, uh, open to other forms of copyright than a lot of, uh, than a lot of traditional publications would be. Um, having said that, there are some works that are, you know, that have uh, restricted copyright, but but the majority, uh, the majority do not um, in the same way. They have restricted copyright, but a different kind of restriction. You know, Creative Commons, uh, Share Alike, for example, is a very common license that people use. Some work, unfortunately, the authors make no indication of, of the license, so uh, so that is then copyright. Uh, by virtue of just being published and not being declared, but most of the people working in the field are aware of this uh, sort of uh, sharing, remix, reuse culture, and it really uh, uh, comes out of uh, the web in a, in a sort of deep sense. The growth of the field has come out of the web. Um, so people want their work to be read um, more than they want it to be copyrighted and to uh, have it restricted in that way.